This video is about soldering. It corresponds to section 3.3 of the Applied Analog Electronics textbook. Now, this video does not include all the information that is in that section, and I strongly urge you to read that section through very carefully before you do any soldering. In addition, if you are working through the university, uh, you are required to fill out the standard operating procedures for soldering sign the forms before you do any soldering. Um, those forms require you actually to watch some training videos on uh, soldering and this is not one of those training videos. So make sure that you do watch the correct training videos on soldering and don't rely just on this video. Okay, what is soldering anyway? Basically the idea is to take two metals and join them with another metal. And this other metal will have a lower melting point than the two metals that you're joining. Uh, the low temperature, low melting temperature metal is called solder, and it's usually a tin alloy. Traditionally it was a tin lead alloy, um, but lead is a hazardous material and difficult to dispose of, and so um, most commercial soldering now uses a uh, lead-free solder. And these are usually tin copper, tin silver, or other tin alloys, but ones that do not involve lead. Um, unfortunately, the uh, lead-free solders are harder to work with than the traditional lead-tin solder. Uh, they have a higher melting point, and they don't wet uh, the materials, the, the metals that you're trying to join, nearly as well as, as the traditional lead-tin solder. Um, American hobbyists still use uh, lead tin solder uh, for home uh, use. Uh, we will not be distributing that through the university. We'll only be using lead free solder, but if you have your own uh, lead tin solder at home, I'm not going to be there to, de to slap your wrist for uh, using it. Okay, so there are a couple safety concerns that you have to worry about when you're doing solder. One of them, obviously, is that we're dealing with hot molten metals. And so you want to make very sure that you don't burn anything. Um, and the temperatures that we're working at uh, depend a little bit on which so what sort of solder we're using. Um, the melting points are like 183 degrees uh, Celsius for the 63% tin, 37% lead traditional solder. Um, they go up to around uh, 227 degrees C for the something like a 99.3% tin and 0.7% copper um, lead-free solder. Um, the lead-free solder is very a lot in composition, very a lot in melting point. Um, we actually heat them a good deal hotter than that. Uh, we generally heat them up to like um, three or 400 degrees C, which is what 570 to 750 degrees Fahrenheit, um, and because they're that hot, it's very easy to burn yourself. It's also very easy if you have a tiny bit of moisture, or um, actually we'll have other um, materials that can be vaporized, like the rosin flux core of the solder. Um, and the result of vaporizing that inside molten solder is that you can get little bits of solder spurting up into the air when you heat it. Um, and that means you should always wear safety glasses. These are not safety glasses because it's possible to get stuff in the sides here. Uh, if we uh, ha have you doing soldering at home, uh, the university will be sending you uh, proper safety glasses to put over your eyes so that nothing gets splashed into your eye as a result of soldering. Okay, the third danger, um, in addition to um, so the heat of the soldering iron itself and the spurting of um, uh, solder due to that heat is that uh, the fumes from the melting the flux core of the solder are hazardous. The idea of the flux is that it is to take the metal that you're soldering and strip off any oxide coatings that are on there because the oxide coatings will prevent the solder from sticking properly and the insulating layer not what you want for a good solder joint. So the flux strips off that. Now the stripping off of the oxides requires a fairly corrosive substance 
and the uh, fluxes that we use are heat activated so that when you heat them up they become corrosive. Um, that corrosive material vaporizes and produces um, some pretty nasty fumes. When we're working in the labs at school, we use fume extractors, which are just little fans with uh, activated charcoal filters, which capture those fumes and um, filter them out of the air. Uh, if you've got um, a fume extractor at home, feel free to use it, but be aware that the little fans that are in them only suck air for about six inches. So you need to be working directly under the fan, basically treating the fan as if it was a fume hood and working inside the fume hood. Um, now, most hobbyists uh, don't bother with fume extractors because the amount of fumes are fairly small. And if you've got good airflow in the room, say by opening all the windows, and opening the door, um, then the buildup of the fumes is not a serious hazard. When we're working in the labs and we've got 12 solderings going at, soldering irons going at once and very poor circulation in the room, windows that don't open, then you definitely need to be using the fume extractors. Okay, so that's sort of the, the main details here for safety. You also want to be careful, again, because the soldering irons are very hot, always put the soldering iron back into its stand when you're done using it. Do not leave it sitting on a table uh, where it can get knocked onto the floor don't have any pets around that can pull on the, the cables for the soldering irons and pull the soldering iron out of the stand and onto the table or onto the floor. It's probably a good idea to work on a surface that either won't burn or that you don't mind if it gets burned. So don't work on you know your dining room table, but um, put down a ceramic tile or something to protect the surface. Um, in fact, one of the reasons I'm not doing a demo of soldering for you here is because I am working on a desk and I do not want to burn this desk. I mean, it's got enough marks from coffee rings and stuff like that. I don't want to have burn marks in it as well. So this soldering iron here is cold. I haven't turned it on. Um, all right, let's take a look at some of the tools we'll be using here. There is the soldering iron itself. It has got a tip here and then a handle. This whole tip region here gets hot. You don't touch anything there. And you notice the tip that you're soldering with is quite a ways from, from the, quite a distance from your fingers. And that means that you can't do very fine control with the sorts of things, you know, where, you know, people hold a pencil really close to the tip. You can't do that with this burn yourself really badly if you tried something like that. You're holding it a long way back, so that means you usually want to be resting your hand on a solid surface so that you don't have hand tremor and wrist tremor here moving that tip around a lot, because you've got to get that thing very precisely positioned. And it helps if your hand is braced when you do that. When you put the soldering iron away, what I just did was wrong. I put it directly into the um, into the holder. Always wipe it off before you put it away because you do not want to have any leftover flux on that tip corroding the tip of the iron. So you always want to have the iron tip being shiny uh, from a coating of the tin from the solder. So wipe it off every time you put it away. And that means every time. Not, oh, I soldered 15 joints here, well, now I'll wipe it. Every time you put the thing back in the holder, wipe it. Just get into that habit. Okay, what you're going to be soldering is one of these teensy LC boards. And you can see they're pretty small. And there's several solder joints you have to make on this. One of them is this little tower that's sticking up here way beyond everything else. That's a three-pin female header, and you're going to have to solder that on. Uh, it is solders on this. You can, if you look on the back side here, let's see if I can hold that steady enough so that this can focus. Um, there are three solder joints here that have to be made for that: a ref, 24, and 25. The pins 24 and 25 there are the differential channel for um, analog input on this board, and there's uh, one or two labs where you might find it useful to have that differential channel. 
it's not a serious problem if you don't use the differential channel. We have got lots of uh, analog pins on the outside here that we can use, um, and you can measure two and take a, do a subtraction uh, digitally. Uh, the differential channel does give you a little bit more flexibility in some ways. Okay, so the first thing to do is to solder on this one, and make sure you solder it on the correct side of the board so that it sticks out the top here with all the other components, and it gets soldered on the bottom side of the board. The, after you've done that, the male header pins get soldered in. Now, you'll have the male header pins in a strip like this one. And so the first thing you have to do is to count out the right number of pins here and break the long strip into the right uh, length. And you want to do that counting very carefully because you're off by one, you're going to be really annoyed. It's, it's really a pain to work with single pins. So I check very carefully that I've got the right number here. Okay, then I hold the pin right next to, so I'm, these are the ones I want to keep and these are the ones that I want to remove. I grab the next pin up the plastic with the pair of pliers and then I can just snap that off. And if I've done this correctly, I've got exactly the right number of pins here. Okay, now I've done this I did this earlier with uh, some red pins, and what I've done is I've pressed these pins into the breadboard. The long tail side here, notice there's a short and a long side, the short side is the solder side, the long one is the, where the header pin goes into the breadboard. And I've pushed these into the breadboard at the correct spacing so that I could just take one of these uh, teen CLC boards and rest it on there, getting all the pins to line up all at once flat and that makes it much easier to do soldering. So you can use your breadboard here to hold the pins for soldering. Now these pins, they're nice and shiny, they look like gold. Well, that's because there is actually a little gold on them. These are uh, steel pins with a nickel plating on them and then a very thin gold plating over the nickel plating. The pads on the um, PC board here are also shiny and gold looking. That's because they're also a thin layer of nickel on top of, in this case, copper, and then a very thin layer of gold electroplated over that. Um, this sort of coating on a printed circuit board is referred to as an ENIG coating, E-N-I-G. That stands for electroless nickel gold. Uh, the nickel is put on with a non-electroplating process, a chemical process, and then the gold is put on with an electroplating. Another uh, type of coating you'll see that we'll use later on for the hysteresis oscillator board is looks more like a like it's a silvery solder colored uh, coating, and that's an HASL coating, hot air solder leveling, and that is actually just solder on the board, and both the gold coating and the solder coating on the board is to prevent copper oxides from forming because the copper oxides are difficult for the flux to remove and um, interfere with the process of soldering. So there's coatings that are used to protect the copper from oxidizing so that you can then solder them easily. The electro-nickelous gold, electroless nickel gold, the ENIG coatings, are the ones that you see on the things like processor boards and other things that have to do a lot of fine pitch work on um, cheap stuff that has only through hole point parts, you will often see just the hassle coating because it's much cheaper. Okay, um, let's take a look at some of the tools we'll be using and um, what it is we're trying to achieve. I showed you already the tip of the soldering iron. Um, the way that you do the soldering, and here I will sort of roughly demonstrate, um, is you will have the soldering iron braced in your hand, you'll press it against both the pin 
and the pad at the same time. Uh, again, there's better photographs in the book because I can't get this camera in close enough to do that. Then after about a second or two, you press the solder against the tip and then pull it away from the other side of the pin. So you're basically taking the wet solder, the molten solder, and pulling, pulling it around the pin to um, get it to cover everything. And you will do that sort of one joint at a time going down this. Uh, there are pictures in the book of what good and bad solder joints look like. Let's actually take a look at a sort of a cross section um, so we can see what it is we're trying to achieve here. And the idea is that the pin or the wire that's going through the hole um, should be mechanically firmly connected to the board. There should be a solid block of solder there. And the solder should be wetting both the PC board pad and the pin so that you get this meniscus uh, shape. Um, and you can detect bad solder joints by deviations from that shape. If you've got a solder joint that is um, sort of a Hershey's kiss where it's got the right top shape but on the bottom it curves the wrong way so it, it curves in at the bottom, um, that indicates you didn't heat the pad enough or that the pad was dirty and the flux hadn't cleaned it. Um, and so the solder did not wet the pad. The solution when that happens is to reheat the solder joint and make sure that the pad gets hot enough um, that the solder melts and flows into the hole properly. Um, sometimes if you have as big a spacing as we've got here between the pin and the board, um, the solder will just go through and start dripping out the bottom because it's um, not, the surface tension isn't enough to hold it in place. We generally don't have too much trouble with that in this class because the holes aren't so much bigger than the pins. Um, sometimes it's a, a little bit of a problem if you heat up your solder a lot and it doesn't cool by the time it gets to the other side of the board. Um, you can have some flowing through. Um, so watch out for that also. Um, if you get something where it's kind of an apple shape and it's curving in at the top, that means the pin wasn't hot enough and you have to reheat the pin to try and get that uh, wetting of the solder on the pin. In fact, the pad should be completely covered with uh, solder and so should the top of the pin so that the, the, the whole surface there should have a shiny solder look and not gold flecks or, or um, black holes from the solder being missing or not covering the material. Um, if you do get too much solder on the pin and you get a blob instead of uh, the nice meniscus, you can remove some of the solder. And there's a couple different ways to do it. One of them is just to take the soldering iron, press it against the pin, and then to try to shake off the excess solder. Um, that sometimes works. Uh, if you've got just a tiny bit excess, that sometimes is the just heating it up with the iron and getting it to flow onto the iron is often enough. But we have some other tools here that can also be used. Um, both of these are different versions of the same tool. They're called solder vacuums, or more colloquially, solder suckers. And this is a one-hand tool. You basically hold it in one hand, and for this one, you use your thumb to prime it. There's a piston in there, and I've just uh, pushed it down, and it's latched. When I press this button, the piston pulls back up again, pulling a puff of air in the tip. So what you do, you prime it heat up the joint you're trying to um, clear, and then press the button. This tip here is um, heat resistant, and so you can put it right up against the solder joint as you're trying to remove the solder. This larger solder sucker um, works more or less the same way. It's got a somewhat larger volume of air that it pulls in at once, so you can clear up uh, bigger solder messes with it. Um, it's a little bit harder to prime because you can't just push your thumb here. That's got an awfully long spring, but you can push it against the bench to prime it. And then again, the button is one thumb pressing. So that this can be used the same way. Um, hopefully you won't need to use the solder sucker too much because um, it is possible when you're unsoldering things to damage the board to 
pull the copper pads off the board, things like that. Um, and then generally the board is unsalvageable. Um, I think that's probably all you really need to know for now about soldering. Do watch the training videos on how to do the soldering correctly. Do look very carefully in the book at the examples of um, good solder joints and bad solder joints so that you can look at your own solder joints and recognize whether you've done it well or not. When we're doing this live in the lab, the group tutors and I usually spend a lot of our time looking at people's solder joints and saying, oh, this one's a little bit too cold soldered. This one has uh, got too much solder on it. This one doesn't have enough solder on it. Um, that's hard to do over video. It's very hard to, you know, bring the device in here close enough to the camera and get it in focus so that, to actually see whether the solder joint's any good or not. So um, we're going to be having to rely much more, if you're soldering at home, much more on you doing your own inspection of the solder joints. So do look at uh, the pictures in the book and pictures in other sources to learn what a good solder joint looks like and what a bad solder joint looks like. Okay, I think that's enough for now.